So here's an image of your digestive tract. The total surface area on which microbes can live is about 400 square meters, which is over 4,000 square feet. Different parts of the intestines can be characterized by different types of microbes. The composition of these microbial communities is strongly affected by environmental factors of the different gut regions, such as the type of digested products, the pH, the water content, the oxygen content, nutrients and micronutrients, and other properties. These ecological conditions not only determine what commensals can live where, but also they determine what pathogens can infect where. So remember, every microbe has its own optimal environmental conditions that encourage growth. We talked about that when we talked about microbial growth and control of microbial growth. And so different microbes are going to be restricted to certain kinds of environments and therefore different gut regions. The three main components of the intestine are the microbiome, the epithelial cells, and the mucus layer. The epithelial cells are shown here. These are these tan cells. Those are just the cells that line the intestine. And then here in pink is shown the mucus layer. And then the microbes are going to be in the lumen where the digesting food is. So remember, we talked, it, when we talked about the innate immune system, we role, talked about the role the mucus layer plays in immunity. Right? So the role of mucus is to trap microbes. It also contains antibodies to help us control microbial growth. Goblet cells are the cells that secrete the protective mucus layer, and the goblet cells are not shown here. Goblet cells under a microscope, they they're almost clear in the center because they're synthesizing so much mucus, and so there's this huge, almost like vacuole that is just it's just where the, all the mucus is produced that it secretes out into the lumen of the intestine. So you have these intestinal epithelial cells that are in, occasionally interspersed with goblet cells that produce all that mucus. The microbial community in our intestines interacts with our immune system in complex ways. They trigger immune responses and also train the immune system to tolerate certain types of microbes. The mechanisms by which this works have not been fully explained, though we are rapidly filling in the gaps in our understanding. Some microbial defense molecules are excreted by the cells that line the intestine constitutively. And we've learned about constitutive genes when we talked about gene expression. So remember, when we talked about gene expression, we talked about how some genes are turned on and off, but other genes are expressed constitutively, meaning they're just expressed 100% of the time. It doesn't matter what the environmental signals are. Okay? So that's shown in this panel on the left. Some defense genes, defense molecules that the cells, that these intestinal epithelial cells can produce are just expressed con constitutively. They're just expressed all the time, being produced all the time, not up and down regulated, not turned on or off in response to environmental signals. Okay. Um, another type of communication with the immune system involves the cells lining the intestine receiving what I'm now going to call MAMPs, microbial associated molecular patterns. So we talked about PAMPs in the past. So in, in, when we talked about the adaptive and the innate immune response, we talked about how there are these toll-like receptors, which are shown in this panel here, which receive PAMPs, or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And we talked about how PAMPs are molecules that you find on pathogens that are common to many pathogens, like peptidoglycan, all bacteria, have peptidoglycan, or lipopolysaccharides. All gram-negative bacteria have lipopolysaccharides, right? Or, or flagellin. All bacteria with flagella have the protein flagellin. So those are examples of what we used to call pathogen-associated molecular patterns. A lot of medical researchers still call those pathogen-associated molecular patterns, though if you think about it, that can't be accurate. All bacteria have peptidoglycan, not just pathogenic bacteria, all bacteria. So it's more accurate to call those kinds of molecules microbe-associated molecular patterns, or MAMPs. So now that we're talking about the microbiome, we're talking about not just pathogens, but also commensals and mutualists, we need to change our language. Because research on microbes until very recently was very pathogen-biased. We only cared about pathogens. Now we care about all the microbes because we're discovering that it's not just pathogens that affect our health, our health, but also our mutualists and our commensals that have a strong role to play in maintaining good 
health. And so we care about all the microbes, not just the pathogens. And so we're now going to call those, my, those kinds of molecules that are shared by many microbes, microbe-associated molecular patterns. It's the same thing. It's things like peptidoglycan, shared across many microbes, lipopolysaccharides, shared across many microbes. It's just that now in our language, we are acknowledging that it's not only pathogens that have those microbes, mm -hmm. but, uh, excuse me, it's not only pathogens that have those molecules, but all microbes that have those molecules, okay? So, so another type, so this, in this middle panel here, we're looking at another type of communication between microbes and our immune system. Uh, and it involves the cells that line the intestine, these intestinal epithelial cells, receiving MAMPs, or microbe-associated molecular patterns, from the gut microbes. And in response to receiving those MAMP signals, these intestinal epithelial cells will excrete defense molecules. So these are not genes that are expressed constitutively. They're genes that are expressed in response to environmental signals. So here's an intestinal epithelial cell. Here's its toll-like receptor on its surface. And I told you before when we covered TLRs, they're unique in that you, know, you find TLRs on, on immune cells of the innate immune system, but you can also find them on a few other cell types in the, in the body. And this is one, place where, one other place you find them, in the mm -hmm. intestine. So you have this toll-like receptor binding to a microbe-associated molecular pattern like peptidoglycan or lipopolysaccharide or flagellin. And once the toll-like receptor binds, this cascade of events is set off inside the cell, which eventually results in a signal being sent to the nucleus, to the DNA, to activate transcription of a certain gene that is a defense molecule. That defense molecule then gets translated and expressed, excreted from the cell, into the lumen of the intestine to control microbial growth. So you can see that in response to receiving a microbial signal, this intestinal epithelial cell is excreting a defense molecule that kills bacteria. Okay. Um, all right. So, and then it, you see the same thing in this panel on the right, but it's slightly different. You have this microbial signal being received from the cell, and this, this one happens to enter into the cell. So instead of docking with a toll-like receptor on the surface of the cell, it enters the cell, but the result is the same. It initiates transcription of certain defense molecules. Okay. So on the left panel, you have these defense molecules that are ex uh, excreted by your intestinal cells constitutively, and then in these the middle and the right-hand panel, you have um, defense molecules that are released by the intestinal cells in response to signals from the microbial from the, the microbial environment. So I want to remind you that so so in these ways, populations of microbes that live within the intestine are controlled. And I want to remind you that. Um, there are microbes that normally live peacefully with the host, but for some reason can sometimes begin to grow uncontrollably and so become pathogenic, and we had a word for that. It was opportunistic pathogens. So many of our microbes that typically live peacefully with us, if given the opportunity, they would try to overwhelm our immune system and take advantage of our resources, and so they would become pathogenic. This is, explains one of the ways that your body is constantly, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, maintaining a, a healthy boundary between you and your commensals and your mutualists. So when you die, your immune system shuts down, and you decompose not because of microbes outside of you, but because of mostly from the microbes that are already living inside of you. When your immune system shuts down, there's no longer a boundary, and those microbes digest you. It is your immune system that creates a healthy boundary with your microbes so that they can take from you, but not too much. And you can capitalize on the things that they are able to give back to you. Okay. So, so here you see that you might wonder like, why you have this, this whole community of mutualists giving you vitamins, digesting your food and your gut. Why are your intestinal cells producing all these antimicrobials? That's why. You need to prevent overgrowth. These microbes are only healthy because you are able to create a proper boundary. Your immune system is always managing growth, always preventing overgrowth, always preventing your mutualists from becoming opportunistic pathogens. So this is not for you to memorize. I just am showing you in this diagram that the, the ways that your body, that your immune system interacts with your microbes are really complex. These are some 
of these communication networks that have been described and mapped out already. And we still don't know very much. So in this, you, this is an intestinal epithelial cell. Here's a whole bunch of different kinds of receptors on the surfaces of your epithelial cells. And then here's the pathways inside of them. These represent the complex communication pathways that we have already mapped out between the microbes of your gut and your, your human body. Because when we, we thought immunity was complicated, we thought, and, and immunity is just about killing pathogens, you know, what, the way we discussed it before. But when you're talking about the microbiome, there are commensals, there are mutualists, there are opportunistic pathogens, there are pure pathogens all mixed in together. And your body needs to learn to differentiate between the good microbes and the bad microbes so that you can allow a, a wide diversity of microbes to live with you, but get rid of the pathogens all the same. We're going to learn a small portion of this pathway. So this is described in your reading for this week, which is a challenging paper. It's a, it's a peer-reviewed review paper that discusses some of the ways that we, under, that we currently understand of how your, um, your microbiome in your gut communicates with your intestines and with your immune system. So I'm going to, to break down some of that here. So in this simpler image, the main thing I want you to take from this is that this, this is called the NF-kappa-B pathway. And I want you to remember that NF-kappa-B is a protein complex that controls transcription of immune system-related genes. So you have to remember what transcription is then to understand that. Transcription is when DNA is transcribed into RNA, and transcription is followed by translation, where the the gene in the RNA form is translated into a functioning protein that does something for the cell. So transcription translation is part of gene expression. So you have a gene in the DNA. To express it, it has to be transcribed and then translated. Okay? So NF-kappa B is a protein complex that controls transcription of immune-related genes. NF-kappa B is inhibited until signals from outside the cell trigger a kinase that breaks up the inhibitor. So here you can see you have NF-kappa B is this dimer here. It has two components. It's got this dark blue and light blue component. And it's capped by this inhibitor in brown. So when the inhibitor is there, NF-kappa B cannot initiate transcription of immune system related genes. But once that inhibitor is removed, what it does is it goes to the nucleus, it binds to the start of immune-related genes, and it helps RNA polymerase initiate transcription of those genes. Okay? So when it's off, when, when it's inhibited, when it's off, these immune genes are not expressed. When the inhibitor is removed, NF-kappa B can go and initiate expression of certain immune genes. Okay? Typically, it's off. Typically, it's inhibited. Typically, these particular immune genes are not expressed. But when certain signals from outside the cell come, and are when certain signals are received by the cell, that's going to cause the inhibitor to be removed. And it's going to once the inhibitor is removed, our NF-kappa B is going to go to the nucleus and initiate transcription of these immune-related genes. Um, this pathway is implicated in cytokine production. And remember, cytokines are communication molecules of the immune system. Typically, they initiate an immune response. They can attract immune cells. They can initiate um, synthesis of immune cells in the bone marrow. They can activate immune cells. So they can, they can uh, cause, they can be involved in inflammation and fever. So, so cytokines are often the the proteins that are expressed in this. So, so basically, NF-kappa B, when, it's, when the inhibitor is removed, it might go and cause transcription translation of cytokines, which are then released into the body, and that initiates an immune response. NF-kappa B plays a key role in regulating the immune response to infection, and it is also involved in cellular response to other kinds of stresses, such as free radicals. Incorrect regulation of NF-kappa B has been linked to cancer, inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, septic shock, viral infection, and improper immune system development. Though the research is still young, this could explain why 
or this could partially be implicated in how er, why or how early antibiotic use and dysbiosis in our later years can lead to problems related to the immune and metabolic function. And I'll, I'll explain that as, as we go through this, because now we're going to talk about how your microbiome programs this NF-kappa B pathway. So the article that you're going to read discusses the polar nature of your intestinal epithelial cells. This means, what, what we mean, I know that when you're thinking of polar, you think of chemistry, and you think of a molecule that has a, a positive end and a negative end. But what the word polar really means is having different properties on different ends. That might be related to an electromagnetic charge in a molecule, but it could also be something completely different. So when we're talking about how intestinal epithelial cells are polar, what we're really talking about how is talking about is how the two ends have, of these intestinal epithelial cells have different properties. It's not that they have different charges; it just means that the two ends are different. So on the ap when I say the apical side, I'm talking about the side near the lumen, near, near the food that's digesting. The basal side is near your bloodstream and near the inside of your body. Okay? So the apical side, immediately you can see these two ends are different. The apical side is really wavy. That's to enhance nutrient absorption. The basal side is not. Um, and these intestinal epithelial cells are held together by tight junctions, and that separates the top, the apical side, where the food is digesting from the basal side. Tight junctions are, ex they're just what they sound like, extremely tight. They hold these cells really, really close together so that nothing can slip between them. Okay? There's other kinds of junctions between cells. Desmosomes are stronger, but they're not as tight. So tight junctions are weak. In, in, you know, each individual tight junction is very weak, but they hold these cells so close together that there's no gap. There's no way that anything could slip between. That's really essential for your intestines because you don't want viruses slipping in between uh, the cells and getting into your body. You don't want my other kinds of microbes slipping in between. You, the, anything that can pass through from your intestines to the inside of your body has to go through the cells themselves. Okay, not it can't slip between them. Um, so in the article that you read, another so, so one way that these intestinal epithelial cells are polar is that you have this wavy side for nutrient absorption and you have a not wavy side. Also another way that they're polar is that they, endocytosis happens on one side, exocytosis happens on the other side. Things don't go in reverse, in one way, out the other. That's another way that they're polar. But a really important way that they're polar that you'll just, you'll read about is that TLR9s, the toll-like receptors on the apical side, behave very differently from the toll-like receptors on the basal side. And that's what's important to programming to accept the microbiome. So this is a better close-up diagram of tight junctions between cells, um, along with the diagram showing where they exist in the epithelial cells. So the tight junctions are closer to the apical side, and they prevent microbes from penetrating the epithelial cell layer so that the microbes cannot leave the intestine to enter our bodies. Okay, so it looks kind of like thread and stitching. So you can think, you know, thread, st stitching like of a seam, the, the stitching on your seam is made out of thread. And thread is really weak. It's easy to snap. Right? So if each individual stitch is really weak, but collectively they're strength in numbers, and they can hold two pieces of fabric really close together. So I think thread is a really good analogy for these tight junctions. So the TLR9s is really what I want to discuss when it comes to the microbiome. So TLR9 is one type of toll-like receptor. There are many kinds. They all receive microbial associated molecular patterns, but so they all receive these generalized microbial signals, but each one will accept a different MAMP. Okay? So they're numbered. They're just numbered to distinguish one type of toll like receptor from another. Okay? So we're going to focus on TLR9s. TLR9s are especially important for our gut microbiomes. So, like all TLRs, TLR9s coat the epithelial cell surface. So these intestinal epithelial cells, the apical side, well actually the whole cell is just covered in toll-like receptors of various kinds, TLR9s, TLR5s, other kinds of toll-like receptors. Um, but when it comes to TLR9s, that's where we see this polarity, this differences between sides, sides of the epithelial cell. 
So the toll-like receptor number nine on the basal side down here, when they bind to a microbe-associated molecular pattern, they are going to stimulate that NF-kappa B pathway, thereby stimulating transcription of genes involved in immune responses. Conversely, when the exact same toll-like receptor, toll-like receptor number nine, on the apical side near your gut, you know, near the microbiome, near the digesting food, when these ones bind to a microbe-associated molecular pattern, these are going to inhibit the NF-kappa B pathway, thereby stopping transcription of genes involved in immune responses. So when TLR9 up here near the digesting food are stimulated, when they bind to an MAMP, they stop the immune response. When the TLR9s down here are stimulated, they initiate the immune response. And that is important to creating tolerance for your good microbes, because you have trillions of microbes living in your gut and they are supposed to be there. If you are constantly having inflammation, immune responses from those microbes, you'd have a problem. It would damage your microbiome, which is essential for good health, and it would also create chronic inflammation in your gut. So you want to tolerate these microbes in your gut. But if those microbes penetrate the epithelial layer, maybe there's a wound, maybe some tight junctions have been um, disrupted or something, and these microbes get into your body, that's bad. So any microbes that are on the basal side, you want to have an immune response against them. You don't want chronic inflammation. You want to tolerate these microbes when they're in the right place. You do not want to tolerate them breaching that barrier, though. So up here, tolerance. Down here, immune response. Also, interestingly, the apical TLR9s, once they're triggered, the ones up here, once these TLR9s are triggered, they are going to inhibit all the other TLR responses in that cell, thereby setting and stabilizing inflammation responses to your microbiome. After TLR9 stimulation on the apical side, the side near your microbiome, some other TLRs have reduced ability to initiate inflammation, and so do the basolateral TLR9s. Thus, TLR9 regulate inflammation and regulate tolerance responses for your microbiome. This is why you are not always experiencing inflammation in your bowels, even though your intestines contain trillions of microbes. Without the TLR9s, you would have, you would have a lot more inflammation. So it is the TLR9s that dampen inflammation and moderate your, your immune response to your own microbiome. So to recap, depending on what side of the epithelial cell the TLR9 exists on, TLR9s can either stimulate or inhibit that NF-kappa B pathway. The NF-kappa B pathway is involved in inducing expression of genes involved in both adaptive and innate immune systems, such as genes involved in inflammation or B cell production, activation of immune cells, among many other things. So one thing, there's this, some really interesting research on the TLR9s of mice and mouse microbiomes. So we can take these mice and we can knock out their genes to express certain types of TLRs. So we have mice that are knocked out, their genes for TLR9s are knocked out, meaning they cannot produce TLR9s. And we compare them to control mice who still have TLR9s, and we compare them to other control mice that have had a different TLR knocked out, like TLR5. And then we give them some sort of, of gut irritant. So what, we, what researchers gave them is uh, they gave them dextrin sulfate. Dextrin sulfate pro provokes colon inflammation by inducing mucosal erosion, um, and that sometimes causes infiltration of commensal bacteria into you know, across this intestinal epithelial barrier into the rest of the mouse body. So not only does, um, not only does dextrin sulfate induce inflammation, it also increases the risk of disease because it disrupts this intestinal epithelial lining. So it allows microbes from the gut to get into the mouse body and cause infection. So mice that do not have TLR9s when they are exposed to dextrin sulfate, they have much worse inflammation, they develop ulcers really quickly, and they die. 
When mice that have no genes knocked out or TLR5s knocked out but still have their TLR9s, when they're fed the exact same thing, they survive much longer. So this is taken as evidence of the importance of TLR9s in moderating the inflammation response.